I am a farmer and rancher and that's what, uh, what I enjoy doing. I'm not a professional speaker by any means. I, I'd feel a lot more comfortable if we were back home on my ranch in North Dakota. There we go. Can everybody in the back hear me? All right? All right. Good to go. Thank you. So, it was about a year ago Chris first contacted me as far as if I'd consider coming to Pennsylvania and I absolutely jumped at the chance because the only time I'd seen Pennsylvania was in either the Pittsburgh or Philadelphia airport and I didn't think that that was a, a good indication of what real Pennsylvania was like. So, so it's good to be here and share with you and all I'm going to do with you today is share with you the journey that my family and I have been on the past 20 plus years as we've learned to focus on the soil. And so I'm going to share with you the, the journey we've been down, where we were when we started, and, and where we're at today and what I see for the future. So North Dakota looks at, at times a lot like Pennsylvania. We can tend to get a lot of snow. And you're going to ask yourself, well, what do we have in common with North Dakota? Well, we can get cold there. This is the number of days last year below freezing. 223 days Bismarck, North Dakota, that's where I'm located. So our growing season is, is relatively tight, but as I'll explain to you, we've been able to extend that a bit by focusing on soil health. Now, I don't know how it is here, and I, I know in Pennsylvania, but uh, I know you were a bit colder than normal, I hear, this past winter, and back home when it's a cold morning, you know, the farm cats, when you pull up in the yard with a warm vehicle, they like to jump on that warm vehicle. Well, here's what happens in North Dakota. <laughs> so we, we can get a bit cold in North Dakota. So what do, we, what do we have in common? What does North Dakota have in common with Pennsylvania? Well, the answer is soil. Uh, I spend the greater part of my winters traveling around the world talking about soil health. And we have that in common. No matter where I go where there's production agriculture, these principles I'm going to share with you today, you can use them. Because they're the principles of nature and they absolutely work anywhere. There's people all over the world on every continent where there's production agriculture putting these principles to work. So a little bit about the history of our operation. My operation was founded by my in-laws back in 1956 and they farmed it from 1956 to 1991. It consists of about 5,000 acres. Of that, there's 2,000 acres of perennial native range. There's 1,000 acres of cropland that was converted back to perennial forages, and then there's 2,000 acres of cropland. So we have about 5,000 acres. Now, we're in about a 16-inch total moisture environment. Of that, approximately 10 inches is rain, six inches comes from the snow. So that's what we're working with, all dry land, no irrigation. So my in-laws had this and they were primarily on the 2,000 acres of cropland, they were all small grains, spring wheat, oats, barley, all cool season grasses. Half summer follow half crop, so they only, you know, had a crop on those cropland acres every other year. And they were heavy tillage, high use of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, etc. Now when I purchased that operation in 91, I was fortunate we did some baseline uh, soils work and what we found is that organic matter levels on the cropland were from 1.7 to 1.9 percent. Now the soil scientists will tell me that historically organic matter levels on the, the perennial native range were in the 7 to 8 percent range. So in other words we had lost three quarters of the organic matter off those cropland soils due to tillage. They also did a double ring infiltration test and we found that we could only infiltrate about a half of an inch of rainfall per hour. So that's not very much. You know, it's crucial that I capture every raindrop where it falls because we just, we're just limited on moisture. So that's what I had to start with on the cropland. On the grazing system there was only three pastures. They ran about 65 cow-calf pairs, 35 yearlings, pretty much season long grazing calved in the late winter and then the, the pears were run on crop aftermath uh, after combining and then we fed hay six to seven months a year and we calved in the corrals and it was confined in the lots. That's just the way it was. So that's kind of like it was when I started. First couple of years I used those same conventional 
practices. And, and I'll never forget my father-in-law when he was teaching me about farming because I was born and raised in the city. My wife said that she would never marry a farmer, so she married a city kid who became a farmer, but more to that on that later. But my father-in-law told me, the more you work the soil, the better it is. So that's the mindset of, that I went into this with. But what I saw over time is that I was continually being hard and seeing a loss of our resources. Uh, these photos were taken, that's my neighbor's field right behind where I'm standing there, and we had a real strong windstorm a couple days after uh, he seeded. That's the middle wire on a barbed wire fence that I'm pointing to at ground level. In other words, the soil, the topsoil blew off, and there you can see the wheat seed. He completely lost all of his topsoil, and he just had wheat seed laying right on the soil surface. And over time, I noticed that what I was really seeing in agriculture was symptoms. You know, we had to put on more and more synthetic fertilizer to get the same yield. We were having more fungal diseases. We were having to spray that more. You know, it was all about treating symptoms. I don't care if it was too much moisture, too little moisture, we had poor infiltration, we had more weeds. These are all just symptoms. And after time, you know, the piggy bank was really starting to get a bit thin there, and I noticed I just can't keep this up. You know, it doesn't make sense to me. All I'm doing is putting more and more into my operation and getting less and less out of it. I came to the realization over time that I had really come to accept a degraded resource. I realized that what I was trying to farm and ranch was degraded, and I'd come to accept that, and I needed to change my resource. So how do we improve soil health? That, that was the real question that I posed to myself, and I found the answer when I walked my native rangeland. I mentioned to you, have, that to you that I have 2,000 acres of native range. Well, when I walked that native range, I saw things happening there that I did not see happening on my cropland. So I started studying native range and taking a look at it, and I looked at how nature did things. And if you look at how nature works in a true native ecosystem, what do you see? You see, for one, there's no mechanical disturbance. Now, of course, there's some disturbance when you have floods or hurricanes, tornadoes, etc. But there's no mechanical disturbance in a natural system. There's always armor on the soil surface. That soil surface is always covered unless it's a catastrophic event. Nature just works that way. If there's bare soil, she's going to put weeds there. She's going to start something growing. Nature cycles water very efficiently. You know, it, it's just a natural um, movement of water that will supply the needs of whatever forage is growing. There's living plant root networks in nature. In nature, these plants work together for the benefit of all. There's a lot of nutrient cycling going on via biology. And how many times do we go to our agronomy center and they talk about biology? Nobody's raising their hand. Okay. Same back there. I, I never had my agronomist talk to me about biology. Now, I know nowadays if you go to Gerard, he's going to talk about biology. So will some of the others. The other thing is there was thousands and thousands of years of research and development taking place. You know, so often today I hear this being talked about as what we're doing today is conventional agriculture. I tend to disagree. I think this here, nature's way, is the real conventional agriculture, just that we've moved away from it. Well, what happened in my situation, the years 1995 through 1998, I had three years where I was hailed out, lost 100% of my crop to hail, one year of drought. So I went through four years in a row with no crop income. And that was really, really tough on a young family starting out. At that time, in 1997, I took a, a course in holistic management, and there was a gentleman there from Canada, a rancher, who practiced holistic management, and he told me this, and I'll never forget it. He said, if you want to make small changes, change how you do things. But if you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. And I was so glad that I was in attendance when Don Campbell said that because that really stuck with me all these years. And it got me thinking, 
I had to change the way I viewed agriculture so I could make positive changes on my own operation. The first thing that I had to do though was change my mind. And you know, I talk to tens of thousands of people every year. And I know the majority of them sit there and they say, well, that can be done in North Dakota, but it can't be done on my operation. You're absolutely right if you have that attitude. However, if you change your mind, it can be done. I tell people wherever I speak right now, I will bet you my operation against yours that I can get these principles to work on your operation. I've said that to people in Australia, South America, South Africa, Europe, China, Russia, everywhere, and it can work. There is zero doubt in my mind. I have yet to have anybody take me up on it, but I would welcome the challenge. So if you think it can't work on your operation, come on, I'll, I'll take that bet with you, okay? So what I'm gonna share with you today, this morning, is the five keys that we've d discovered over time are really the keys to regenerating soil health. First one, Least amount of mechanical disturbance possible. Look at how nature works. There's no mechanical disturbance. Yet, as producers, what do we do? We go out there and we destroy that living root, and that living root is necessary to store carbon, build organic matter, cycle nutrients. We need that. Yet, for years, what did I do? I went out and tilled. This is a great photo that Ray Archuleta put together a gentleman had a forested area and he took and cleared part of that forest. Well, that forest was 4.3% organic matter. He then farmed it with tillage, 17 years of soybeans. That's the same soil, side by side. Organic matter level dropped to 1.6%. I wish I would have been able to archive my soils when I started out because this is what they look like. They were compacted from all the tillage. How much water can infiltrate into this soil profile? Which one's gonna have more soil life? Which one's gonna cycle nutrients? We've come to accept this degraded resource today, and we, we don't have to do that. We can change that. This photo here is probably the most dramatic, oops, it's not showing up, there we go, dramatic, visual of how fast we can do it. Young man by the name of Michael Thompson down in Kansas came and listened to Ray Archuleta and myself speak four years ago and he went to his father and he said, Dad, I think we need to try no-till and some diversity. And to his father's credit, his father, rather than scoffing the idea, said, Michael, let's try it. So they took a field of theirs and they split it. For three years then, they used no-till, they use diversity of cash crops and cover crops. That's the change in that soil in three years. Which one has more carbon? Which is gonna infiltrate water? Which has more soil life? It's easy to see. We can regenerate soils much, much faster than we used to think possible if we use the principles of nature. The moral of the story is it's carbon that drives farm profit and I'm gonna discuss this with you today. So on our operation, we actually went out, 1993, we bought this 750 no, John Deere no-till drill. We've been 100% no-till ever since. This is what it looks like on my operation when I'm done seeding. How much bare soil is there? How much am I gonna to lose to wind erosion, water erosion? Is soil life gonna be able to function there? One of the big things we gain if we don't till the soil is we proliferate mycorrhizal fungi. How many of your agronomy centers talk to you about mycorrhizal fungi? Don't feel bad, mine didn't either. Had to learn about it on my own. Mycorrhizal fungi is key to building a healthy soil and it's free to us if we provide the home for it. What mycorrhizal fungi does, that's mycorrhizal hyphae, mycorrhizal fungi secretes a glue called glomalin, and that glue sticks soil particles together. It starts the formation of soil particles. There's under a microscope. That's new soil particles being formed. You have to have these soil particles in, a, in a order for you to infiltrate water, and that pore space between the particles is where soil biology lives. 
This is a close-up photo of that 1 16th of an inch where on our no-till drill that disc cut the soil. Look at those soil particles. Soil should look like black cottage cheese. When I started out, my soil was tan, dull, lifeless, and no aggregation to it. This is what it looks like today. Here's what else mycorrhizal fungi does. On the left is a plant that does not form that symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizal fungi. You can see how the root area extends out, but it's only going to be able to get nutrients from that zone. The light yellow here, that's mycorrhizal fungi. It stretches out for hundreds of yards in a soil. It then forms a relationship with the roots and you're able to transfer water and other nutrients throughout a much greater area of the soil profile. One of the world's foremost authorities on mycorrhizal fungi is Dr. Christine Jones from uh, Australia. Dr. Jones has discovered mycorrhizal fungi th that one fungi actually covers 2,500 acres. So think of that. Those plants that form that relationship, they can transfer nutrients over 2,500 acres. That's absolutely amazing. But due to tillage and other factors, we've destroyed that. What our, bu our buscular mycorrhizal fungi does is it forms a relationship with the root and it actually colonizes in the root. So that fungi occupies cell spaces in the root. Well, what have we noticed in production agriculture lately? We're starting to have a lot more problem with pathogens and nematodes. Well, it's because we don't have that space in the root already occupied by mycorrhizal fungi. If that space was occupied by the fungi, there'd be no place for those pests to get into that root. So we're actually compounding our own problem. So there's ways we can, there's things that mycorrhizal fungi do. It improves aggregate stability. I talked to you about the glomalin. Build soil carbon because it takes, the, those root exudates then feed biology and then nutrients are transferred back to the plant. Improves water use efficiency and I'll show you a series of photos coming up that prove that. And then it increases the efficiency of nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur. Now, interesting enough, what are we doing in production agriculture that's a detriment to mycorrhizal fungi? Chemical use is a detriment. Tillage is a de detriment. Synthetic fertilizers are a detriment. And we don't have a living plant root in the ground at all times. So you see the current production model we're using and that I was using for years, I was actually harming the mycorrhizal fungi in my soil. And then they're no longer able to work for me. This is a photo I took off the front deck of my house on June 15, 2009. The National Weather Service was forecasting a major rainfall event, which in Bismarck, North Dakota usually means a quarter of an inch, but, but <laughs> started raining at 5.30 in the evening. By 12 midnight, we had had 13.2 inches. We had another 0.4 inches the next morning. We ended up with 13.6 inches. Jay Fear, who is our district NRCS conservationist, came out and took that photo immediately following the rain. Is there any way, Chris, to dim these lights at all up front here? Um, but that's a little hard to see. You can see I lost a little bit of the residue, but for the most part, that doesn't look like there was 13.6 inches of rain there, does it? He then dug down in the soil and dug this piece of soil out. Does that look like it had 13.6 inches of rain on it? Now think back, if I would have had the soils that were compacted, what would have happened? I would have had major erosion. We would have had, there you go, thank you. We would have had uh, a lot of movement of soil itself, of the residue. Jay often makes the comments to group that he's sure you could have went and drove across that field with any implement and not rutted the field up. It's not how much rainfall you get, it's how, how much can your soil infiltrate and then move throughout the soil profile. Now, I'm not kidding you, I did not infiltrate all 13.6 inches of moisture, but that does not look bad. We were able to take as much as we could, move it throughout the soil profile. 
Now I mentioned to you that when we started we did that baseline work, half inch of infiltration per hour. 2011 NRCS came out and I, at that time I could infiltrate over eight inches per hour. So we had a 16 fold increase in the amount of moisture that we could infiltrate and move throughout the profile. This is a picture three weeks after that rainfall event of my neighbor's field just across the road from me. Same neighbor that lost all that soil in, a, in the windstorm. Well, how come he still has water sitting there and I don't? My land sits lower than he does. Here's the reason. I've been on that place since 1983. Every fall he goes out and he digs that low spot. Every spring he gets in there and he's able to seed it. I can count on two fingers the number of crops he's combined off there. Why? He's destroyed all the pore spaces. He's destroyed the infiltration. That soil is so compacted the minute we get any rain it's going to pond there and be there. We compound our own problems. Key number two, armor on the soil surface. Look at what happens in a perennial ecosystem. You always have the surface covered. I, got, I get a laugh out of this picture. I fail to see why that man spent the dollars on a no-till drill, huh? But I, this is really common. We see people out there with this equipment, yet the soil is bare. Two years ago, my son said, Dad, on Father's Day, they're having a soil health tour, and I want to take you on that for Father's Day. I said, great, sounds interesting. This is what we saw. That was a soil health tour. We were touring on an organic operation, no residue on the soil surface, and they had had a two-inch rainfall event, and they got that kind of erosion. That's what we're seeing in production agriculture when there's not armor on the soil surface. My friend Ray Archuleta put this together and I thought it was really titled brilliantly. It says, the soil is naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever. Think of that when you see bare soil. Well, there's no armor. There's nothing there to feed soil life. There's no way it's going to infiltrate much water and store it there. And it certainly has higher soil temps than where you have the surface covered. Look at a perennial ecosystem. What do you see? This is from one of our perennial pastures. Always covered. This is how we farm now on our place. That's a picture of us planting into cover crop residue. You can see on there that I don't use trash whippers. That's way too much tillage for me. There's no reason for them. We want that soil covered at all times. Doesn't matter if we're using a planter or a drill, the same thing. We strive to have 100% ground cover all the time. Now it's a challenge to keep that cover there, as I'll explain coming up. But the crop has no problem emerging through that residue. But how many other weeds am I going to get germinating through that? Not that many. We get some weeds. I'm not going to stand here and tell you I don't have weeds. But it's going to be much more difficult for weeds to come if we have that type of a residue. The other thing that residue does is it really buffers heat. And during August, we can get pretty hot and dry. We'll typically have a 60-day period in July throughout August into early September where we don't get any moisture at all. It's imperative for us that we have to keep soil temperatures cool. This is a, a photo. We took some soil temperature readings on a day. It was 98 degrees outside. Under the cover crop, it was 87.6 degrees under the armor. On bare soil, it was 107 degrees. And you might think, well, 20 degrees difference. Does that make much? Does that matter much? Well, bare soil will easily be 10 to 30 degrees warmer on a hot day, and it'll be 5 to 15 degrees colder on a cool day. So in other words, I'm actually, my temperatures are going to warm up faster in the spring with that armor. Now I know what you're saying, no, no, I don't see that, I don't see that at all. Well, that's because we don't have enough life in the soil. Once we build biology in the soil, it's just like you putting all of us in this room. It's going to warm up, right? There's billions of microorganisms in a teaspoonful of healthy soil. That soil will warm up much faster. Here's what happens with soil temperatures. So if, 
If soil temp's about 70 degrees, that plant's going to use 100% of the moisture it has access to for growth. As the soil temperature rises, that plant starts shutting down. So once we get to 100 degree soil temp, not much of that, that moisture is going for growth. And if we get much higher than 100 degrees, then we start affecting soil biology negatively. Now I've been on a lot of bare soils all over the world where soil temperatures are 140, 150 degrees. That's not uncommon. We're killing soil life at that point. We're doing our ecosystem much more harm than good. So I mentioned it was 98 degrees outside that day we took those temps. That's what I found right under the soil surface on my operation. This took place in late July, yet we still have plenty of earthworm activity on our operation. How many earthworms? Well, move across uh, apart the residue, that's solid earthworm castings. I tell everyone, when I first took over that operation, we, I could never go fishing, because you'd never find an earthworm. Last spring, my son did earthworm counts. 12 inches by 12 inches, 2 inches deep, we were averaging over 60. Now that's at the peak in the spring, but that's a lot of earthworms. Where are those plant roots going to go when that new seedling germinates? They're going to follow that earthworm channel right down. Earthworm castings are the most nutrient dense fertilizer there is for plants. Why not take advantage of it? This is free. It doesn't cost me a thing. All I got to do is provide a home for them and they're there. Third principle of soil health, diversity. Look at a true native rangeland and what do you see? Tremendous amount of diversity. This is a photo from one of our native paddocks and I actually bought this land in 2002. And I bought it for two reasons. First reason is a tremendous amount of diversity there. My son teaches rangeland management at the local community college there and he brought his students out to this paddock and in a two hour time frame they found over 140 different species of grasses, forbs and legumes. That's a tremendous amount of diversity. Now the other reason I bought that, that land there was because with that many rocks I'd never be tempted to break that up. You know? <laughs> now I, I thought I had a lot of rocks but I was traveling in Australia and I locked the brakes up on the car when I saw that picture. <laughs> if you look closely that is seeded. There's oats coming up there. Now don't feel too sorry for him. Look in the upper right, he picked the worst ones. You know, there's a rock pile up there. <laughs> a friend I was traveling with me, him and I were out taking pictures like a couple dumb tourists and the farmer pulls up. You know, well then what do you do? You pretend you're the dumb tourist you are, you know, and we just explained we're farmers from the United States. He says, yeah, I know this field's kind of bad, but we got visiting with him and that fall he emailed me photos of him combining that. How would you like to take your equipment across that? I think I'd have that custom done, but anyway. <laughs> so you see that type of diversity in a native ecosystem. What do you see in production agriculture today? And I spend a lot of time traveling and all I see, monoculture wheat, monoculture corn, monoculture beans. What happens with monocultures? I showed you this photo before, that's 17 years of monoculture beans. Look what we're doing to the ecosystem. What are we doing to the soil? Monocultures are a detriment to soil health and I'll show you that. 2006 I had the opportunity to meet this gentleman. This is Dr. Adamir Caligari from Brazil. He is, in my opinion, the world's foremost authority on cover crops. He's worked in 65 different countries all over the world helping people heal their soils through the use of cover crops. Dr. Caligari during his presentation told us two things that really stuck with me. First thing is he said you give me two inches of precipitation a year or 200 anywhere in between I can grow you a cover crop. Well that told me no matter where I was in the world where there was production agriculture I was going to be able to grow covers. The other thing he said is Cover crops are meant to be seeded in multi-species combinations. And I'll never forget when he said that because I hit myself on the head and I went, Gabe, you stupid idiot. All these years I'd been growing cover crops in two or three way combinations. Why didn't I just look at the native ecosystem and see how many species there are there? I should be planting more than two or three species in my mixes. So I was a supervisor on the Burley County Soil Conservation District 
And we went back to North Dakota and we have some plot land that's located exactly a mile south of my operation. And we decided to test Dr. Caligari's theory. We decided what we would do is we would seed cover crops as monocultures in strips and then at the end we would mix all the species together and seed them as a diverse polyculture and see what happened. Now the winter of 05-06 was really open in North Dakota. We didn't have a lot of snow and snow was a big part of our precip. So we went in there in May and it was extremely dry and we seeded these cover crops uh, as monocultures. Here's what the turnips look like on July 31st. That's an, a, a photo of them. We only had an inch of rain from seeding until when these photos were taken. And they'd be what you'd expect on an inch of moisture. Well right next to the turnips was the oilseed radish. Completely dried up. On down the line we went until we got to the diverse polyculture. How can you explain that? We've been told as producers that you can't have any weeds in your field, you can't seed diverse species in there because it's competition. Really? That's not how nature works. Nature, through mycorrhizal fungi, forms symbiotic relationships to transfer nutrients. I explained that a little earlier. NRCS clipped those plots and this is what we, they found. Look at the difference. Now, the difference at the bottom between half rate and full rate, we didn't understand really what we were doing as far as uh, seeding rates. We simply had too many plants per square foot when we got to what we called the full rate. But look at that. We tripled, almost quadrupled biomass production in the diverse mix. Yet, what are we doing today? We're seeding monocultures. Does that make sense? Dr. Chris Nichols, who is a microbiologist with ARS, explained it this way, and she's talking about mycorrhizal fungi. Not only do the fungi provide for the needs of one plant, but that fungal hyphae pipeline connect to multiple plants, thus satisfying the nutritional and energy needs of both the plants and microorganisms. That's how nature works. We just have to learn to work with her. It, that, Summer proved to me beyond a doubt that monocultures are a detriment to soil health. Where in nature do you find monocultures? Very, very rarely. Usually only where man put them or something man did caused them to become monoculture. It's diversity that drives soil health. If we want to have a truly healthy soil, then we have to have a diverse ecosystem. So what we started doing on our operation, and we started moving into this back in the mid-90s, but it was to diversify our crop rotation. So we know there's four major crop types. There's cool season grasses, cool season broadleaves, warm season grasses, and warm season broadleaves. So on our operation, I mentioned how when I took over, we were only planting cool season grasses, spring wheat, oats, and barley, now we're planting, for some reason, this is very slow, it's not coming up. We also plant corn, brown midrib, sorghum, and sunflowers, showing up on my screen, but not up here. But we plant some of all four crop types because we need the diversity. The fourth principle, living root in the ground as long as possible. Look at a native ecosystem. You have cool season grasses, cool season broadleaves, warm season grasses, warm season broadleaves. You have all four crop types and you extend that growing season. You know, back home we got really warm last week. It was in the 70s. We already had crocuses coming up in the, out in the native pasture. So there's something growing already, even though our last frost in the spring usually is sometime around mid-May. But we have something living. In the fall, we're going to have living plants well into November, even though we start freezing in early September. So you have a living root in the ground as long as possible. What that living plant is doing is it's obviously collecting sunlight through photosynthesis, pumping liquid carbon into the soil through root exudates, keeping biology and mycorrhizal fungi alive. There's a reason for that, yet you look at what we do in production agriculture today. We're not taking advantage of that. Approximately two-thirds of your organic matter increase will come from roots. You have to have roots. Roots build that. And the exudates they secrete is what builds humus or, or carbon in the soil. 
Those living roots secrete liquid carbon. That carbon feeds soil life. Soil life, along with mycorrhizal fungi, builds soil. We're not going to build soil by applying manure and just by putting organic material on there. It's the living component in the soil that builds soil up. So, because of that principle, this is what we do in our operation now. We're no longer seeding monoculture cash crops. In the upper left, that's oats with three types of clover. In the upper right, that's a mixture of cool season broadleaf forages. The lower left, that's corn with hairy vetch. Lower right here is sunflowers, and there's actually over 20 species of cover crops growing in those sunflowers. The reason for that is we can combine off the cash crop and we have that living cover photosynthesizing, putting liquid carbon into the soil throughout the whole growing season. Here's a close up pictures of the oats. We have not used synthetic fertilizer on our operation since 2008. We found, we did a series for four years in a row, we did a a, a series of trials where we fertilized half of a field, no fertilizer on the other half. All four years, the non-fertilized was equal to or greater than the fertilized in yield. So why would I want to write that check? So we quit using synthetics. Now we don't use any synthetics. We have not used any pesticides since before the turn of the century, with the exception of pesticides that were on seed coating and we removed them five years ago. So we haven't used any pesticide even in seed coating in the last five years. Haven't used any fungicides since before the turn of the century. Use no post-emergent herbicides because we have that living clover crop in there. So we haven't used glyphosate now and it's, I think it's going on seven years, okay? But we use shadow, different herbicides like that if I have to do a burn down. But we, we can usually get by two to three years without a, a herbicide treatment. What we do when we seed the oats is we seed the clover at the same time. And then that clover, obviously it's a legume, and it's fixing nitrogen, supplying it to that oat plant, and then also as soon as we straight combine the oats, then we have that living cover, that clover takes off and, and uh, grows. You know, I find it absolutely amazing, above every acre of land, there's about 34,000 tons of atmospheric nitrogen. In North Dakota right now, a lot of people are excited because they're going to build two new nitrogen fertilizer plants costing billions of dollars. Really? Nitrogen's free. All we got to do is plant a legume. So you're telling me farmers would rather write a check than seed a legume. Does that make sense? We're using tons of fossil fuel to produce nitrogen when it's free. I just can't understand that one. Here's corn and there's hairy vetch and clover growing in with the corn. Look at that living cover. How many weeds are going to germinate in there when I have a, that thick mat of vetch growing in there? Now, in our dryer environment, I have to seed these covers. We did try broadcasting and if I get rain, I can go in there and broadcast and then that's uh, clovers and some brassicas, that's what it looked like in the fall, but that's kind of a hit and miss in our dry environment. You may be able to broadcast, I don't know. You have to determine that on your operation. I can't tell you whether it will or will not work. Here's the sunflower crop. Now, when we start talking about cover crops, a cover crop in my mind is a diverse mix that enhances the life and the function of the soil. That's what I'm trying to do with the cover is I'm trying to feed soil life and, and enhance that soil life. These are just a few of the cover crops we grew on our operation. My bottom ones are not showing up for some reason. We actually grew over 70 different species of covers this past year. Don't pay any attention to what I grow in North Dakota. May or may not work here. That's for you to decide. That's for your agronomist to help you with. There's a lot of good seed dealers have booths out here today. Talk to them. They can tell you what works in this environment. All I'm trying to impose on you here is that I try and grow some of all four crop types. We're trying to feed that soil a very diverse diet. Now when you plant cover crops, you just don't go seed a cover crop. And I'll talk more about that this afternoon. You first have to ask yourself, what's your resource concern? What is it I'm trying to do to that particular field? 
Do I want to improve infiltration? Do I want to improve mycorrhizal fungi? Do I want to increase organic matter? Do I want to alleviate compaction? Do I want to feed wildlife? Do I want to feed my livestock? What is it I'm trying to do? You've got to figure out your resource concern first. NRCS and the soil conservation districts would be happy to help you with that. The other thing is you, you need to fill the production gaps. When in time do I not have a living root in the ground? What period of time during the growing season? Now this is, a, there's a lot of people who are just growing corn and beans. Oh, I got something living in the ground at all the time. No, you don't. The season lasts a lot more than that. And perhaps it means you have to add another cash crop to your crop rotation to allow you a window of time that you can plant to cover crop. Now there's a lot of good seed dealers out there and I'm not recommending any. I'm just giving you this website, greencoverseed.com, because you can go on there and click on their smart mix calculator and there's a really good program to help show you and walk you through how to design a cover crop mix. Now, there are others out there too, okay? But when you go on there, it's going to ask you for your, your zip code and then it'll automatically plug into the closest National Weather Service station so it will know your precipitation, it'll know your growing degree days and then you can go in and you can design your own mix. This is free to use, they don't charge anything to use it and it's a really good tool to get you thinking about diversity and about designing a cover crop mix. Now, the fifth component of building a healthy soil is animal impact. Look at how our soils were formed, you know, pre-European settlement. What did we have here? You know, in the northern plains there, we had herds of bison and elk. In this area, you had, her you had a lot of elk and you had deer too. There was a lot of animals, and we're talking about the insects, the rabbits, the birds, all that. We don't see that so much in production agriculture today. The animals are in confinement, they're not out on the land. What we're doing on our operation is we actually have, uh, well, I'll tell you this now, but I told you how we could only support 65 cow-calf pairs, about 35 yearlings. Today we're running 350 cow-calf pairs, we're running 4,800 yearlings in grass-finished beef, we've got a, a flock of sheep, we've got pastured hogs, We've got broilers and we've got pastured layers. So we're trying to get those animals out on the land and then they're harvesting different levels of energy. They are taking the place of the bison and the elk and all the birds and the smaller mammals that were once on our prairie soils. Now I'm not telling you that you need all these species. Only you can determine what you want to have. And it may, you may not want any of them. But I'll tell you this much. Every time we add another layer, we ratchet up our soil health. As we get closer and closer to mimicking nature, our soils get healthier and healthier. This is how we convert most of the cover crops to dollars on our operation, and I'll talk more about this this afternoon. But we allow livestock to convert them to dollars. When we graze those covers with livestock, we do not have them graze at all. We only let them graze about a third of the above ground biomass. The remaining two thirds is that armor on the soil surface that I talked to you about. That is a cover crop the following spring that we had livestock grazing on during the winter. Now, I'm gonna show you what I think is one of the true travesties in production agriculture today. This is quote unquote, a standard NP and K soil test. Now I know this is too hard for you to see, but in the upper left over there, it says pounds of nitrogen in the top two feet of the soil profile, 10 units of N. Okay, that's a soil test from that cover crop field. How many bushels of corn can I, you get off 10 pounds of N? 10, okay. I'll show you what I can do. Here we are planting into that residue. I told you I'm a no-tiller. On the left, that's planted. On the right is not. No trash whippers, that's too much disturbance. So there we are seeding into that residue. Now, I normally plant corn between the 15th and 20th of May. Okay, so we start with this much residue. Oop, I gotta get over here, there we go. There's what it looks like by June 16th. Here's July 1st. Where's my residue going? I'm certainly not out there cultivating. I'm kind of allergic, oh, I shut down here, there we go. 
I'm kind of allergic to tractors and work, so I'd stay away from that. Here's what that corn looked like then at tasseling time. I didn't apply any nitrogen. There was no manure added except what fell out of the cattle during the winter. There's no compost, no compost tea, no biologics, nothing. That's what it looked like on ta at tasseling. Dr. Ray Ward, who owns Ward Labs, Kearney, Nebraska, came up, took the leaf tissue analysis himself and ran it. Top line there is nitrogen, it says it's in the high category. That soil test showed I only had 10 units in. Where'd the nitrogen come from? That's what the field looked like that fall. I'm embarrassed of this photo, but I put it in here to prove a point. That is the reason I now seed cover crops in with my corn. Because that bare soil there, what's going to happen when it rains? I'm going to have erosion. What's in there feeding soil life right now? Nothing. What's happening to soil temperatures? They're increasing. Here's what we yielded for corn. This is 2012. County average in Burley County is just under 100 bushels. That's what I can grow on 10 units, supposedly 10 units of N. Here's my total cost in 2012 to produce a bushel of corn. This is over the whole farm. Hmm. Okay, now, since this time, we've dropped out of crop insurance because they would have never paid me anyway because I have covers growing in with corn. So they would have disqualified me anyway, so I no longer take part in any crop insurance programs. But all I'm imposing on you, I know your expenses will be different, but look how cheap I can produce a bushel of corn. Last fall, corn in North Dakota dropped to $1.73. That's how large our basis was. I can still make a few pennies. Now, I haven't grown any corn in two years because there's other crops that I find much, much more profitable. Back when corn was 6.98, I made a lot of money with corn. It's not how much yield you get. I've got neighbors who will out yield me, but I'll guarantee their cost of production is over $4. Average cost to produce a bushel in corn in North Dakota is just over four bucks now. I can do it for $1.44, and I can do it for less now because I quit wasting money on crop insurance. This is the reason I can grow corn so cheaply and other crops so cheaply. The soil is alive if our management allows it to be. Soil without biology is just geology. The reason that test didn't work is that soil test only took into account the physical and chemical properties of the soil. It doesn't take into account anything that the biology is doing. I posed the question to you when I started, how many of you, when you walk into your agronomy center, does the agronomist talk about biology? That's why they want to sell you something. And I'm not here harping on all the agronomists. I'm just saying that's a fault in the current production model. We're not taking into account life in the soil. How did our soils function for eons of time without anybody out there putting synthetic fertilizer on? They did, right? They functioned well. Dr. Rick Haney, who's a soil scientist, ARS Temple, Texas, has developed a soil test which takes into account the biology in the soil. And Dr. Haney is able to, to tell you the amount of, of water extractable organic carbon in the soil. In other words, that food that that soil biology will eat. So if you send a soil sample in, and I know Woods End Lab does it, there's several labs, or Ward Labs at Kearney does this test, there's several labs that do this test now, they're able to predict how much N, P, and K you'll be able to cycle because of the biology in your soil. So when you move into this type of a production model, you're able to tell how much you can start backing off on synthetic fertilizers. And I'll get into that a little more this afternoon. But it's a wonderful soil test. It's the next step in determining how we can get health back into our soils. Now, for those of you who don't like livestock, I show you this. This bar graph here uh, is soil tests taken on two of our fields. They're side by side. They've both been no-till for 20 plus years. They both had very diverse cash crops, very diverse cover crops. The only difference is the yellow barred uh, graph there has had high stock density animal impact grazing covers two of the previous six years. 
On the far left, that's nitrogen, 86 to 90 pounds, no difference. But look at the phosphorus, 65 pounds to 239 pounds. What's happening when livestock graze covers, or any animal, graze those covers, that plant then sends a signal, hey, we've been injured, we gotta, re we gotta regrow, send out root exudates, or secrete liquid carbon into the soil, attracting biology, that biology then starts that plant going. When that happens, it causes that biology then to start breaking down unavailable forms of phosphorus, converting it from organic into inorganic. The third bar is potassium, same thing, huge increase. I was told for many years, Gabe, your system's gonna crash. You'll never be able to keep going because you'll run out of phosphorus and potassium. Really? Then why over eons of times didn't our native ecosystems crash? That's not how nature works. We have plenty and it can cycle through. Just that we've destroyed the biology in our soils so it's no longer becoming available. Vandana Shiva said it best, in nature's economy, the currency is not money, it is life. I used to wake up every day when I was farming, quote unquote, conventionally, trying to decide what am I gonna kill that day? Is it a weed, is it a pest, is it a fungal disease? What am I gonna kill? Now every day I wake up and try and determine what can I help live today? Because I wanna have a living ecosystem, not a dead ecosystem and there's a huge difference. We must start looking at our soils as a living ecosystem because that's what they are, they're alive. Now, I mentioned to you organic matter levels when I started, 1.7 to 1.9 percent. Last time we tested our, our organic matter levels on our cropland fields were from 5.3 to 6.1. Had I started using all these principles immediately, there's no doubt I'd be at eight to 12 percent now on my organic matter levels. We can increase them much faster because we have a continually living root that's pumping liquid carbon into the soil. That is just key. You've got to feed soil life. When we do that then, we increase the amount of nutrients in our soil. When I started out, I was less than two percent organic matter. Now we're up near six percent organic matter Look at the amount of N, P, K, sulfur. That doesn't even take into account all the micronutrients in our soil. Why would I want to go write checks for things when I can get them through natural and biological means? The other thing we've been able to do, as you increase organic matter, you increase the water holding capacity of your soils. I have silt loam soils, middle column. I started with less than 2% organic matter. So I could hold about two inches of moisture per foot of the soil profile. Four foot profile, I could hold eight inches of water. Now today I'm well over 5%, I can hold over 20 inches of water in the top four feet of our soil profile. We only get about 16 inches a year. You can improve this substantially and significantly on your operation. It's not how much moisture you get, it's how much can you infiltrate and hold. Yesterday at the conference they were talking about, there's usually a period during the summer here where a lot of the crops become stressed for moisture. They're not gonna become stressed if you are able to hold the water in your soil profile. For every 1% organic matter, you can hold somewhere between 20 and 27,000 gallons of water. Now, this figure will vary according to, uh, I gotta quit moving around so much. That figure will vary according to what study you looked at. But when I started out, I could hold about a quarter of a billion gallons of water on my operation. Now we can hold almost one billion gallons of water. I am convinced we create our own droughts. There's no doubt about it. It all has to do with soil and how healthy our soils are. Oh, this computer needs to be plugged in, it says. It's gonna crash on you. So. Water use efficiency. I was down in southeast Missouri. They get over 50 inches of rainfall a year. And they were getting about 200 bushel corn. They were adding another 50 inches from irrigation. So over 100 inches of moisture, they were getting 200 bushels of corn. I get 16 inches of precip, can get 142 bushel corn. So water use efficiency, they were getting about two bushels per inch. 
I'm getting about 8.87 bushels per inch. So I told them down there in Missouri, I said, think of it, guys. If you improve your water use efficiency, you should be getting 887 bushel corn, right? <laughs> there is absolutely no reason they even have to irrigate. 50 inches of water should easily produce 200 bushel corn. But they've destroyed their soils, so they have to keep putting on all that irrigation. Makes no sense. No sense at all. Soil carbon is the key driver for the nutritional status of plants and therefore the mineral density of animals and people. Soil carbon is the key driver for the moisture holding capacity of soils. Soil carbon is the key driver for farm profit. We have to start looking at the carbon in our soils and then we can convert that to profit. Now, this is Colin Sice. Colin's a friend of mine from New South Wales, Australia. Colin has developed what in my mind is the ultimate cropping system. He is standing in a field of perennial native warm season pastures, over 30 different species in his perennial pastures. What Colin does then, he goes when those warm seasons start going dormant because it cools off, he'll go in there and he will seed a cool season cash crop. In this case, that's oats coming up. The next spring, he combines off that oats and there's the warm season grasses coming up. And I have some photos this afternoon to show you, uh, or this morning to show you some of the other things he's doing. That's the ultimate system because he has that perennial living root in the ground at all times, and then he's also producing a cash crop. So what we're doing on our operation, we know our season isn't quite long enough to do that, but we can do some things to mimic that. We're seeding a lot of our cropland back to perennial warm season grasses, and then we'll be seeding a fall biennial cool season into it, such as rye, triticale, hairy vetch, winter wheat, etc. We're gonna mimic that on our operation. So this is what we've been able to do by focusing on soil health for over 20 years. On the left there is what we started out with. We started no-till in 1993. 1995, we really started to diversify the cash crops. We started adding more of those different cash crops into our rotation. We saw a bump in organic matter. 1997, we started to integrate more and more cover crops into the operation, another bump up in the organic matter, and our soils really started to grow at that time. 2006, after hearing Dr. Caligari, we went to the multiple species covers, and I'll talk more about that later this morning. Another step up in the health of our soils. 2010, we really started integrating high stock density livestock grazing. I'll talk more about that this afternoon, how we're grazing these covers. Another bump up in soil health. Now my son and I have been working on a plot of land on our place that we've gotten up to 11.1% organic matter in a short time just using these principles. We can regenerate soils much, much faster than we thought possible. That's what those 11% organic matter soils look like. If you take nothing else from my presentation this morning, take this. Plants fix dirt. You have to have living roots in the ground at all times, a diverse mix of living roots to regenerate soils. Because if we have healthy soil, we're gonna have clean air, clean water, and Chris talked about that. That case in Iowa is the tip of the iceberg. Farmers are gonna be under the gun to be responsible for anything that's moving off their property. If you have healthy soil, you're gonna not have to worry about that. You're gonna have clean air, clean water, healthy plants, healthy animals, and later today I'll talk about healthy people. Because the consumers out there are starting to hold the producers accountable for the products, the food that they're eating. And that's the next step when we talk about soil health. So with that, do I have time for a few questions, Chris? Time for maybe two or three questions. Okay, a couple of questions. Anyone? Yes, sir. One of the things that, uh, that I face in, in my environment where we have much higher rainfall and a lot of times almost saturated conditions over winter and early spring yep. is getting the soil to dry out and warm out, warm up in the spring for planting. Yep. How does no-till affect that as compared to conventional? Yep, that, that's a great question. In these wetter environments, 
And I've worked with in a lot of environments of 100 plus inches of moisture a year. Much, much more difficult conditions than here. It's a matter of increasing the crop intensity. You're not using the moisture. If you plant cover crops, think of what it'd be if you had a living cover crop in with, say, for example, a corn crop. After you harvest that corn crop, that living cover crop continues to use moisture. Meanwhile, it's pumping carbon into the system. It's going to use that moisture up. Or you plant a fall seeded biennial, and I know from talking to Gerard, rye works extremely well here. You have that rye crop photosynthesizing, building soil health, but it's using that moisture up. It's a matter of you need to increase the intensity of what you have growing. So that's the reason. The other thing is think of it this way with no-till. If you have all those roots from the previous crop in the ground, those are pore spaces going down, right? When you shear those off with tillage, you're sealing that up. That way any moisture you get in the fall throughout the winter, it's just going to stay there. It's either going to run off if you got much slope or it's going to stay there. Whereas if you have that living root going down in all those pore spaces, because you didn't destroy them with tillage, that water is going to move throughout the soil profile. That's why I showed that aggregated soil after I had that 13 inches of rain. We can move that throughout the profile. And we can take soils anywhere. I've seen tight, tight clay soils turn into yellow, uh, black cottage cheese looking soils. It's all a matter of using these principles. So that's it. It's diversity, more living roots in the ground. Take care of that moisture. Gerard, do you have anything to add to that? Okay. Okay. Other questions? Boy, we got a quiet, quiet crowd. Here we go. Uh, you're encouraging a lot of diversity hey. over... You're encouraging diversity over both time and space. I can. <laughs> Is this working? Better? There you go. You're encouraging diversity over both time and space. And that seems like it could add more management complexity in a good way. And I was wondering if you could give an example of your rotation, say, over a few years, so how this all works together. Yep. The needs of and so yep. On. He, he's asking to give examples of my rotation. I'm going to answer that with my presentations later today. I'll get into that. I will say I have no set rotation because if I have a set rotation, nature's going to figure it out, right? So if I'm so confused, I can't figure it out, nature shouldn't be able to figure it out, right? No, I joke. But the thing of it is, I don't plant the same crop two years in a row. I diversify my crop rotation so that on a given piece of cropland, in a four or five year time frame, I'm going to have all four crop types. Well, those four cash crop types, we're going to have one, you know, those e over that period. So that gets diversity fed to that soil life. On our 2,000 acres of cropland, we're going to have a cash crop just about every year. Now there's a small percentage of our acres approximately 10% a year we're going to grow full season covers on. And I do that for the livestock component and I'll show you that this afternoon. But we grow cash crops on 1900 acres of our, 18 to 1900 acres of our cropland every year, but we still have a cover crop on all 2000 acres of that, either before the cash crop, along with the cash crop, or after the cash crop. So it's a diverse mix of covers and cash crops at all times on our operation. It might seem like, like it's a nightmare management-wise. It's extremely easy, and I'll explain that coming up this afternoon. Is it time, Chris? I, I think that's all we're going to okay. have for right now. So okay. Gabe's going to be speaking a lot more this afternoon. So um, at this point, I'm going to 